Welcome everyone to our presentation on using virtual functions with DPTK in OpenShift 4. My name is Wuxin Zhang. I'm an associate consultant at Red Hat. And with me today is Ipsian, my coworker and mentor. He is a Red Hat certified architect. All right, Ip, the floor is yours. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, let's talk about basic Linux architecture. As many of you know, the, um, the system memory in Linux is divided into two different spaces, the user space and the kernel space. The kernel space is reserved for the highest trust function within the system, by right? the internal um, OS function right? that, that has the highest trust will go into kernel. The user space is mostly for application development for other program to live in. Next slide. We have network uh, packets uh, that usually become a problem. Um, when we are looking at the network packet, a lot of time they were moving inside the host. We do not know where they are moving to. We do not cannot predict how many were moving. Um, so we were using a system notification to notify when new packet is coming in and we would forward the packet into uh, the allocated buffer. Um, so in Linux, we use a way to uh, call to interrupt the notification. Um, so when the interrupt notification come in, it will be handled by the kernel space. And many of these interrupt created um, when we have when we need to manage different uh, network packets. The more package we come in, the more resources we need to allocate for um, interrupt notification, and that will result in poor performance. Next slide. So a typical packet, as many of you know, it contains the physical MAC address, the uh, logical IP address, and it contains the port number for TCP and UDP, and then it actually contains the data within the level 5 to 7. Right? We, would, we don't want to manage this network packet uh, forwarding in the kernel space. So we would need to come up with a way to improve this problem by gaining better performance. Next slide. So the solution is to use the uh, DPDK data plane development kit to avoid kernel space. Um, so next slide. In the DPDK architecture, um, you can see on the left side is the tra traditional Linux kernel without DPDK. Application is to go through, go from the user space to talk to the kernel space. And from the Linux kernel space, it can talk to different network driver to talk to the lowest level of the hardware that contain the network controller. On the right side, you can see if when we introduce the concept of DPDK, the application can leverage the DPDK library, bypass the kernel space, and go directly from the user space to the uh, hardware space. Next slide. We have different DPDK libraries that uh, help us do different uh, tasks. Right? We, on, we have a library that help us uh, classify, uh, you, you, including the ACL, the hash, and the LPM. We have library to do different extensions that will check for the, the power, the vhost, right? the distribute, the reordering, the job status, and so on. Um, we have QoS uh, that uh, will do the uh, uh, quality metrics uh, to uh, to do the schedule and do the meter. We have the uh, packet framework that more more focusing on the, the pipeline, the table, the port. Um, the core of the DBDK library contains um, you know different memory pool allocation, the timer, um, the memory buffer. Right, all that will be part of the core. And then in the middle section, you have the um, native and virtual um, uh, library that help you do um, different functionality, including the MPI, the, um, the, the, the uh, NFP, right? the um, bonding, the, 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 um, the uh, uh, virtual IO, and all, so on. Right? So those are more on the core level. So you can see that we have different library to help you do different uh, networking activity and this library you can leverage them from the application code itself as long as you can in include the, uh, the dependency of the dbdk libraries next slide so the 
as you guys, you guys can see, the benefit of DBDK is to reduce the uncertainty about the latency that the kernel space, right? Because we don't need to go through the kernel space anymore. Uh, we could improve the network performance. Uh, we reserve the CPU core that are closest to the memories that process the needs. And at the end, we could also cache the big page of the memory. Next slide. Uh, to talk about more about NIC and uh, virtual function, right? This is the uh, a diagram where uh, the top the top level you have different virtual machines, the M1 to the MN. You have the uh, host OS. Under the host, you have the physical NIC. Right? These are your physical NIC. Um, that one one physical NIC would contain multiple virtual NICs. Right? Each virtual NIC is is basically the, the same as the virtual function. They would go through the virtual uh, switch and bridges. And then at the end, it would go out uh, to the uh, physical port as the output. Next slide. So uh, the prerequisite of using uh, virtual function in DBDK, uh, there are two steps. First, we need to configure SRIOV. And then the second step is to configure the huge pages. And we will talk more about these two in the following slides. So first, let's introduce the concept of huge pages. So a huge page is a memory page that is larger than 4K. So normally, we have a huge page of size of you know 2 meg and 1 gig. If the huge page pool is allocated, then the huge page uh, needs to be allocated as well. So we use the concept called transparent huge pages, THP. Uh, THP, uh, we could automate the management of huge pages without application knowledge. But however, THP lead to performance degradation on the node with uh, high memory utilization, as we need to use memory to deal with all these different um, memory allocations. Um, so at the end, application in the port can allocate and consume P allocated huge pages. Next slide. So as you see on the diagram, um, on the left, you, you have the default memory allocation with no huge pages. And they were evenly distributed with 4K of each, right? And then on the right hand side, you can see when we introduce the concept of a huge page pool, we can set up a, a huge page pool of 48 gig and the RAM of 24 gig. And then um, within the pool, you have different uh, segment, right? The two megabyte segment uh, belongs to the huge pages. And and this is the the, the way the, the huge pages were set up within the, within the memory. Next slide. So um, with that configuration, we could improve the performance um, through the increased TLB, right, trans, uh, translation lookup buffer hits. Uh, the pages are locked in the memory, and they don't need, don't need to be swapped out. It provides a RAM for shared memory structure so that we can reuse the memory structure over and over again. Um, the continuous pages are peer allocated and only used for system share memory for the huge pages. So you don't need to you know, jump to different memory allocation for when you search for memory. Um, and then uh, there will be less bookkeeping for the kernel and also for the memory because of the larger page size, right? The, the, more, the larger the page is, the less bookkeeping, the, look, the less index lookup you need to perform. Next page. Next, Bujing, yeah. OK, so SRIOV network operator, um, this is something. Uh, this is the, the second prerequisite we need to configure. So first, we need to uh, create a namespace uh, in OpenShift uh, for the network operator. So the, the namespace will be called OpenShift uh, SRIOV network operator namespace. We need to create the corresponding label called OpenShift IO uh, and set the run level to 1. The operator group uh, uh, we need to be created and needs to be bind to that specific namespace. And then at the end, we need to create a subscription for the operator. Next step. So this is an example uh, CRD uh, in a YAML format. So the kind will be a namespace. Uh, the label will be um, uh, openshift.io one time, one, one level equals one. Um, so first, this would be the first step of creating the namespace. So once you have the YAML file, you do a 
OC create dash F and then the YAML name, then you will create a namespace for you. Next. See, the SRIOV operator group is the second object. The kind of the uh, YAML CRD is operator group. Um, the, you need to set up the target namespace, which points to the OpenShift SRIOV network operator, which is the namespace that you created in the last step. Next. Um, the subscription object um, is the uh, CRD with the kind subscription. Um, you need to basically give it a name. Uh, SRIOV network operator will be the name. Um, the source will be Red Hat operator. The source namespace, um, you, uh, usually for subscription, you can specify this as an OpenShift uh, market space as the source. Um, and then you also specify the, uh, the version to be 4.4 for the channel. And then, yeah, this would be the subscription object. And then you can apply to our OCRPy-F to create this object. Next step. Yeah, so this is a, 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 a demo of creating an ob a project from OpenShift. So you go in and create a project name. And then you go in here. Once the project namespace is created, you can look at um, look at the, um, you can specify the, you also need to specify the corresponding label for the namespace. Um, so once it's created, you can uh, look at the, the list of object, uh, the list of namespaces that were created. Um, yep. And now we can go to the next slide. Um, this is about the uh, operator group and the subscription. Um, once you have the namespace created, you will go into the um, operator group, specify the operator to be installed. Um, and once the operator is installed, you can look at the install operator and uh, check the corresponding version um, and look, look at the instances that were created for this operator group. Um, yeah, so so yeah, remember all these operator come from operator hub from Red Hat. So if you need to search and look for a specific operator, you can just go to the hub and, and search by name. And, and once you select that uh, a version, a operator, you can specify the version. Yep, next slide. Uh, hand it over to you, Wu Xing. Yeah. Thank you, Yip, for the high level overview of DPTK and virtual functions. Um, Yip also showed us how to install the SRIOV network operator. So, installing the SRIOV network operator is the first step in the SRIOV configuration in OpenShift, right? The operator is responsible for managing the life cycle of the SRIOV configurations. So just to recap real quickly, the SRIOV assigns a portion of the NIC to a pod. So we can share the same physical NIC among multiple pods while giving the pods direct access to the network. So the next step in the configuration is adding SRIOV labels to nodes. Um, it's a good idea to install the no feature discovery operator that adds custom label on the nodes so you don't need to add them manually. The no feature discovery operator allows us to find and label resources in all nodes and include a no selector that will be required in configuring the network no policy. This operator finds nodes that are ready to support workloads with SRIOV ports. So if you prefer the web console, you can also install the no feature discovery operator using the web console. Okay, so next we use the installed no feature discovery operator to create a CRD or a custom resource definition that will be managed by the operator. Here's an example of the no feature discovery CRD it has an API version, kind, metadata, and spec. And this is the YAML file. And once you have this, you just do OC create um, the name of the file and the namespace. Again, you can use the web console to create the no feature discovery CRD. Uh, in order to do that, you go to the no feature discovery operator and create an instance. After that, you can check that it's working by reviewing the no labels. You can use this command, oc get node dash dash show labels to validate no labels, or you can interact with the web console as well 
in the web console, go to um, go to compute notes, select the note you want, and then scroll down to see the list of no labels. So next in the configuration is configuring the NICs that will be allocable to provide SRIOV ports. We need to specify not only the physical NIC, but also the number of virtual functions that can be used per NIC. So not all NICs have the same number of virtual functions. So you need to check first to see the, the maximum number of virtual functions for your NICs. Uh, we can use the CRD in the SRIOV operator called network node state to provide that information for us. Using the CI, uh, we can do OC get network SRIOV network state to get um, the number of virtual functions. And here you will see that not all NICs have, uh, will have virtual functions only the SRIOV capable NICs will have virtual functions. We can also review SRIOV capable NICs in the web console. We can go to installed operator, go to SRIOV network state, click on a SR, SRIOV node, and click on the YAML tab to see the detailed information in YAML. So now that we know the SRIOV capable NICs in the environment, we need to select which of the NICs to use. We can use the SRIOV network no policy CRD created by the SRIOV operator. In the CRD, there is a NIC selector specification where you can include the name of the NIC physical function and the number of virtual functions to be used from that NIC in this format. Optionally, you can specify the driver type for the virtual functions in the device type key. You can select one of the following values, net device, which performs the device bind in the kernel space, or FVIO-PCI, which binds in the user space. The default value is net device. However, since we are using DPTK, we will be using the user space. So we will select F. V, uh, uh, VFIO-PCI for the device type to perform the binding in the user space. Again, you can select the device type using the web console, select, um, right, select the SRIOV network operator and create SRIOV node policy instance, and then create your custom YAML file from there. So this is an example of a SRIOV network no policy object. As you can see, NIC selection is done per the SRIOV network node policy. So next, we need to configure the network that will be attached to your SRIOV ports to have SRIOV running in your environment. When you configure the network, you can customize some aspects. For example, if you don't have a DHCP server in your network, you can define um, static IPs on your pods, but make sure that static IP capability is set to true. Um, also make sure that the namespace is where you'll be using the SRIOV network because uh, this custom resource definition will configure the network attachment definition in that namespace. All right, you can do the same thing in the web console. You can create SRIOV network. Um, go to the operator and create, similarly create SRIOV network instance. Okay, so with that, we should have SRIOV working our environment to test our configuration we just need to create a couple pods where we add a secondary network using the SRIOV network that we defined. We also add a no name, node name definition to force the pods to run in different worker nodes. And once the pod is running, we can just pin one pod on another to make sure that they are up and running. 
We can also use the web console to test the process. Here we can create two pods manually by entering the YAML definition. And once the pods are running, we go to terminal to pin one pod from another, just like that. All right. So this concludes the SRIOV configuration in OpenShift. Configuring the DPDK follows the same steps for configuring SRIOV with just a few modifications. First, DPDK requires huge pages to be configured along with the SRIOV configuration. Second, when using DPDK, we should select F VFIO-PCI to bind the device in the user space. Uh, this is a Zambo for an Intel NIC. However, a small caveat here is if you're using a Mellanox NIC, you must use the net device driver type and set this RDMA to true. So as you can see here, the SRIOV network object configuration for DPDK is the same as the one we use for the plain SRIOV configuration. And in order to test DPTK, we also need to have an image that uses DPTK. And then we create the pod, including both the huge page configuration and the SRIOV IOV network definition. All right, here's the pod that we created to test DPTK. We use an image that makes use of DPTK here. We also include both the huge pages that configuration and the SRIO IOV network definition. And in addition, we define CPU and memory requests and limits for the pod. So that's DPTK testing. And in conclusion, we, to summarize, we can use the DPTK libraries and attach a network interface directly to the pod, and that's virtual functions. DPTK libraries offers to free up the kernel space from interrupts by processing the work in user space. We can leverage Red Hat's DPTK builder image from the Red Hat registry to simplify the application building process. And lastly, the base image allows developers to build application powered by DPTK with efficiency and quality. And that concludes our presentation. Uh, thank you all for attending. Can we answer any questions for you? Yeah, I saw that Mel has a question about the blob uh, and the instruction. So yeah, Wu Xing and I will work on the um, the content, um, and we will publish the the blog about the the steps and and um, and the you know details about the command line and show showcase more examples. So so once we finish the uh, publication, we will share the link about about the details of the blog. Yeah. So yeah, just just uh, keep in touch and. Yeah, you have my LinkedIn, and you know, just uh, send me an email. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll uh, share the information once we have the blog published. Okay, so Thomas have a question about um, automation. Uh, could it be more automated? Um, yeah, so um, you can see why we, we are using the operator to op to automate some of the tasks at this time, but but there are still some high-level menu steps, right? Creating the uh, the, um, the namespace, creating the um, the subscription, create the uh, network operator itself, right? So so the the automation is there, but I, I believe yeah, it could be more automated. Right? So um, stay tuned for the for the next version. <laughs> um, uh, I believe that you know we 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 would have more automation coming in right as as part of the wall map as part of the pipeline, um, yeah. So so to answer your question, it will be more automated. In this question. Yeah. Okay. So Mel have another question for the blob. Do you plan to run any performance measurement? Yes, we do actually. This 
this is part of the um part of the um the the the, the goal for the blog basically to to add more performance metrics um to to list out more uh, sla for the operator um and iperf three may not be in the picture right um so that that's a good question yeah so um yeah um uh, the, that iperf three I, I need to take it back to, to the engineering team to see what, what, what they think about it yeah because you know um some, some of some of these we have a limitation of on what what um what, what platform we could support but yeah i'll get back to you on that question yeah. So there is a question coming in the Q&A says, have you worked with other SRILV deployments? How do they compare to OpenShift? If you want to take that one. Yeah. So um, I have not worked on any other SRILV deployment. I only work on OpenShift. But, but that, that is a good uh, good point, uh, Roy. Uh, so we could uh, take a look at that a little bit more. So if you have, do you have a specific um, specific uh, uh, deployment technology that you want to compare with OpenShift? Like, because we, we are from Red Hat, we are mostly focusing on OpenShift. But if you have, have another um, uh, 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 platform technology that you want us to look at and do some comparison, we could do it there too. Any more questions for Wuxing or for, for us? So yeah, so we came from Red Hat Consulting. So if you guys have any question or, or you want to follow up with with some more information about the uh, SRIOV network operator, right? Um, you could contact Red Hat Consulting, um, and and we would be able to help out. Okay, so Mel has another question. There's a hyper C. Okay, take a look at that. There's a hyper three benchmark operator that we use to measure the benchmark. We have seen more than three times drop in BW. Yeah, with VXLAN. Yeah. So, so if you can send us more information about the the benchmark um, that you have, also oh, sorry, the bench width that that you, that you have. Um, uh we we could look into that a little bit more yeah from here at the high level it's hard to tell why there is a three times drop in the bandwidth um but yeah if you can send us more detail and you know if you could include the performance report um and then we can definitely help you and look at that a little bit more thank you mel Okay, so I think we are on time, uh, 11.25 a.m. So, um, yeah, so if you guys don't have any more question, uh, I mean, you, if you have other uh, further question, you can reach out to us to uh, Red Hat Consulting. Uh, we have some, somebody will get back to you uh, with more information. Yeah, thank you again for um, coming to the uh, conference. Nice talking to you. Yeah, thank you everyone for attending. Hopefully, hopefully that was useful. All right, I think I'll end the session for us. Yeah. Thank you, Eve. Thanks, I'm gonna end the session. Thanks, okay.